right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started this evening. Welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. My name is Mike Hawkins. I'm chairman of the Board of Commissioners, Transmini County Board of Commissioners. And my role this evening is to welcome you here to this uh, public information session. Uh, this is not a government meeting. This is a meeting that has come about because uh, the company that is looking at doing due diligence, actually doing due diligence right now on a proposed bioenergy plant here in Transylvania County, working with Transylvania County uh, Department of Planning and Economic Development thought that we really needed to have a public information session to talk about details of this proposed project. The format tonight is pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is, I will hand it off here in just a second to uh, the principals of this company, Renewable Developers, and they will make a presentation that I think also includes a short video, uh, and then there will be a time afterwards, 45 minutes, hour time frame, to answer questions that you might have. The way that will work is our Director of Economic Development, Mark Burroughs, will have the microphone, if you raise your hand, he'll, he'll go through the crowd, and uh, hand you the microphone. We, we want you to give you uh, give us your name and where in the county you live uh, for our information, and then uh, ask your questions. The first thing that I'd like to do tonight is introduce to you Rodney Locks, who is, all of you know Rodney as a city council person, a longtime city council person here in Brevard, Brevard City Council, but, but tonight he's going to speak to you for just a minute, not in that context, but rather in the context as a board member, longtime board member, of the Biofuel Center of North Carolina. Rodney is a board member, so I want to hand it over right now to Rodney for just a second. Wow. I'm glad that everybody's here, and before I... Uh, can you hear me in the back? Before I uh, introduce Stephen Burke, who is the president and CEO of the Biofuel Center, I'd like to talk a little bit about public participation because I am really excited about having everybody come out. And one of the things that we in the city and the county really, really value is public participation and how important it is to have everybody speak, to hear as many sides of an issue as you possibly can get. I leave my, I take off my elected officials hat and put on my engineering hat. I'm an electrical engineer also. And the more sides we hear, the more challenges we have, we can solve them most of the problems, but we need to know what they are. So in this process, with everybody here, I encourage you to speak up. This is a community. We want to hear you, and that's tonight. I know most of you are here to learn, find out information, express yourself, tell us what your concerns are, and that's really great, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. As uh, Mike said, I'm on the board of the uh, Biofuel Center, and I'd like to introduce my friend, because I've known Stephen for years, and I was on the Energy Policy Council with him, and uh, Stephen Burke. Thank you, Rodney. I am uh, Stephen Burke. I'm president of the Biofuel Center of North Carolina. Our legislature, looking forward in 2007, stated that North Carolina, by policy and strategy, was going to work to augment liquid petroleum fuels with biofuels, ethanol and biodiesel, as a tool for economic, environmental, job, and energy gain. To merge in a new sector so many complicated factors, agriculture, the environment, land, community, places, technology, jobs, and gain is no small task. 
And as a result, the state of North Carolina, through the Biofuel Center, like regions, like counties, like Transylvania County, is in the business of learning what it means to try and put on the landscape a new way to gain renewable liquid transportation fuels. The project at hand tonight, as we will hear, initially is largely about producing electricity, <coughs> but in time it might produce biodiesel. And as such, the Biofuel Center, like all of us, is well prepared to help you. <coughs> what does that mean in this place? Thank you, Steve. Rodney said what I should have said, and it's true. We, we were so excited to see so many people here tonight. Please let us know after hearing the presentation. Any questions, any comments, there need to be questions, comments that you might have. Uh, I mentioned earlier this is not a government meeting. It's not. Uh, there is one other county commissioner here. I'd like to recognize Paige O'Mell, Commissioner Paige O'Mell, who is here as well. Uh, we have a couple of commissioners who are out of town, and <coughs> one who is running late at work, he texted me a moment ago, who will probably be here as the, as the program, program unfolds. So, with those preliminaries out of the way, you're here to see the presentation, and I will begin the presentation, I guess, by introducing Mr. Matthew Ross. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Ross, and I'm speaking very loud. I, along with my partners, Peter Byrne, Ken Allison, uh, comprise Renewable Developers. We are a renewable energy company that seeks to develop a biomass system here in Transylvania County at the site of the Transylvania County Airport. Um, our backgrounds are a bit varied. Ken, some of you might know, is a longtime resident and businessman. He is a nursery owner and has other businesses as well. Pete is an investment banker by training and has been a renewable project developer for the last several years. I am a renewable energy project development lawyer, and as such, I devote my career entirely to helping developers develop, permit, and finance renewable energy projects. And that's been solar, it's been wind, it's been biomass, it's been landfill gas, it's been energy efficiency, and several other technologies as well. In addition to that, I'm an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, where I teach about energy in America. <coughs> And I'm also a lead accredited professional, which uh, provides me further background knowledge on how to incorporate energy efficient measures within larger scale projects. So here's a, a rough outline of what we'd like to talk about over the next half hour or so. Um, first of all, we'll talk about the site that we've chosen uh, with Ken. We'll expand upon the team a little bit and talk about the project, its scope, the feedstock, what feedstock means, what the technology is, how we're going to do it. And then we'll get to what I anticipate will be frequently asked questions. And then after that point, after we conclude, all of you, please take the opportunity to ask as many questions as you want. If you feel at the end of the night that we haven't answered all of your questions to your satisfaction, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, I can make my business cards available. Otherwise, if you can write down your name, email address, I'll be happy to reach out. Um, as has been said, it's very important that there is public participation because through this process, um, you'll get to know us better. We'll get to know you better. We'll get to know what your concerns are. Some of them we know already, and more of them we hope to learn. But at the end of the day, we hope to make it a good project that is as low an impact on the community, the county, the region as possible. So the, the, basic, the basic premise is that we're using a system called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis <coughs> is different than incineration, different than combustion, different even than gasification. 
It indirectly heats uh, a feedstock, and we'll talk about these feedstocks, and um, produces a gas. It's a synthetic gas, but it's similar to natural gas, and that gas is then um, used to run a generator. We hope to produce four megawatts of power, and we hope to sell that power to Duke Energy under a long-term power purchase agreement. Um, because I'm a lawyer, I couldn't resist adding a legal disclaimer to the bottom. <laughs> Basically, since I deliberately made it too small to read, it just says that uh, this presentation is for informational purposes only. We're still in the process of developing the project, so not all of the engineering details are set yet. So some of the questions that you will ask that we will not satisfactorily answer, and I know there will be some, some of that has to do with the fact that we're still in the process of working with engineers to design the system. So we hope you'll be patient with us, and as we develop a plan, we will certainly reach out and share with you again. So here's the site. It's approximately 26 acres. It borders Old Henderson Belt Highway to the north, Crag Creek Road essentially to the east. Uh, it has a runway at the bottom, which is where Transylvania County Airport has had its takeoffs and landings over the last 13, 14 years. And um, it will be the site where we house a very small power plant that will take up approximately 1.5 of these 26 acres and in that space produce renewable energy. So why, why are we here in Western North Carolina? There's so many places we could be. Why did we choose Western North Carolina? There are several reasons. One reason is that you're already doing this, and you're doing this a lot. The Advantage West region is already a hotbed of renewable energy projects of all type, and has been the subject of numerous projects, both renewable energy and energy efficiency. This is, for those who can see it, a map depicting the renewable energy projects that have taken place so far. And I know you can't tell the colors, but it includes biomass, geothermal, hydroelectric, solar, both PV and thermal, and also wind. The smaller map on top shows uh, the renewable energy companies in the region. And as you can see, it's a pretty well-populated region. Uh, the chart on the bottom actually shows real numbers, but you already have a couple of hundred renewable energy companies here in the region. So this is the team you heard about, the three of us, Pete, Ken, and myself. We also couldn't possibly do this without quite a large team. This is not the final team makeup, but I wanted to give you an illustrative sense of the type of people that we're trying to work with. Um, we have uh, consultants that are advising us on various tax credits. We have engineering consultants and accounting and financial modeling consultants. We're working with a local engineering firm called McGill Associates to assist with the civil <coughs> site work. Um, we have um, some large engineering firms with extensive experience in developing both the front end processing and also the power plants themselves. And, um, we are getting uh, insurance policies from major providers like AIG. So we're trying to align ourselves, even though we recognize we're a small company, with a lot of large players with extensive experience so that we can make sure that we're developing the best project and product that we can. So what is the project? Essentially, it can be broken up into three technological components. The first is feedstock processing. That's where we take the wood waste, the municipal solid waste, potentially ag waste, and process it so that it's ready to be a refuse-derived fuel to fuel the pyrolysis system that will create this syngas to go into a generator. We're looking at approximately 200 wet tons a day. By wet tons, I simply mean as they arrive. And over the process of the feedstock processing, it will be dried, it will be shredded, it will be sorted, it will be prepared and it will be homogenized as much as possible. Uh, the second piece of the project is um, the actual pyrolysis chamber, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then the final piece is a generator, just like um, you've all seen perhaps a Caterpillar, GE, uh, Cummins, a basic engine.
this is um, not necessarily a system we'll be using, but it, it creates um, it creates the right picture for uh, the process of bringing in the waste and taking it through what's called the MRFing process. A MRF is a material recovery facility, and it is the facility that takes the raw feedstock and actually prepares it into the fuel that will ultimately go into the system. I have uh, some colleagues here from a company called Dave Costile who have had extensive experience in developing these MRFing systems have worked on easily over 100, including close to 20 in this region, including in Asheville and Clyde, North Carolina. I'm going to bring you in at the end, if that's OK, just to keep, keep some flow. But I'm going to do the layman's version, and then I'll let you do the, the expert version eventually. So in the upper, the upper left, my upper left, your upper right of the slide, you have what's called a tipping floor. And a tipping floor is where the dump trucks or the large haul trucks come and actually literally tip the waste onto the floor. It could be municipal solid waste, which is what most of us think of as garbage. It can be wood waste, and it could be agricultural waste. It goes through a series of, of different stages, like an assembly line, where things are sorted and taken out. There are both human interaction with the material. There are people who actually pick out the, the undesirable components. And then there's a system of, uh, of several units that do uh, the, the work by machine. So there are magnetic separators. There are air classifiers. These take out ferrous metals and heavy plastics, uh, respectively. There's an eddy current that takes out non-ferrous metals, like aluminum. And then there's a grinding process and a final drying process to get it ready to go in. So one of the things we're trying to accomplish with this portion of the project, this MRFing portion, is to actually increase recycling. We want to mac maximize the recovery of the, the really good recyclable materials, which we don't want. Provide uh, an additional revenue stream, both for counties and obviously for ourselves. Maximize the energy recovery, which is, in fact, what the MRF is set out to do. It's to create the energy-rich content from the waste that can be sent into the pyrolysis system. And to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, based on the current sizing of our system, we estimate a minimum of 60,000 tons per year of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent that will be saved or destroyed before it enters into the atmosphere. And then, of course, we hope to save or preserve landfill space to extend the life the lives of the existing cells and allow them to continue on without building any further ones. These are some photos that I took without permission from my new friends at Dave Coast Steel. This shows systems that they have built and deployed. And um, <coughs> I'm just going to flip through them so you get a sense of, of what this might look like. So these, there are machines that, that do the separating and the shredding, and then people who actually do the picking as well. Uh, this is cardboard being separated. The second part, we have this now shredded, dried, refuse dry fuel. Where is it? What does it do? Where does it go? It gets pushed in through an auger system, which is a screw conveyor, into a chamber called a retort where it is sent through a pyrolysis system. I'll talk more about that in a second. I'm going to come back. So this is, this is essentially what it looks like. The, the feedstock bin is where the system takes the waste in. This auger system pushes it through the system. This is a, a, a chamber. There's two chambers. The bottom chamber has this super low NOx burner. NOx is one of the pollutants that contributes to, uh, to greenhouse gas and, and also acid rain. And the top chamber is separated from the bottom chamber by a barrier so that the burning going on underneath never touches the waste. The fire never comes into contact with the feedstock. There is no burning. There is no combusting. There is no incineration. It is an indirect heating system like a convection oven, I suppose. The solid feedstock moves through the system. It achieves temperatures above 1,000 degrees. 
gets converted into a gas through a thermal conversion or thermal distillation process. The gas is channeled out and into a storage container. From the storage container, it's cleaned up and then sent into a generator. I have a couple of short videos. We didn't get them. The first one is from the manufacturer and the second one from a competitor, just so you can get a sense of what this looks like. Because a small amount of the pyrogas is used to fuel the burner. 
The system is initially started with propane or natural gas, which is turned off once the system has reached its operating temperature and starts producing its own gas. It should be noted that California is known for having some of the strictest emission standards for burners in the world. ACTI has a long history of producing highly efficient, low emission burners for various commercial and industrial applications and has repeatedly set the standard for air quality with its products, specifically in California. Of course, the primary value of this pyrolysis system is the gas it extracts from the feedstock, which is used to run the generator to produce electricity. However, electricity is not the only output option for the ACTI pyrolysis system. ACTI has developed proprietary pyrogas to liquids technology that is capable of producing various types of liquid fuels and petroleum waxes. Clearly, there is tremendous value in taking unwanted resources and converting them into valuable energy commodities while reducing our dependency on traditional energy sources. Finally, we can clean up the earth and nurse Mother Nature back to health. For more information, contact American Renewable Energy. Thanks for watching. So I, I just have one more video. This is a competing technology, but it's just a, a nice, tight, short 45 second animation. So just to <coughs> bolster what we just covered, but much quicker. system of having the waste come in from either a dump truck or something similar, having the, the assembly line of people and then machines sorting and then shredding, drying, and preparing. feedstock is then pushed through into the chamber with a screw auger. Uh, it's indirectly heated. This model has um, low NOx burners on two sides instead of just one side, so it's three chambers. It's devolatized through the system and turned into a synthesis gas. And then the synthesis gas and the biochar go into their respective locations. The synthesis gas, again, into a gas skid or gas bladder where it's held before it goes into the generator. And the, the biochar ends up in a container where it's saved and can be sold either for agricultural or industrial uses. That's, that's the essential part of the system from the feedstock processing to the pyrolysis. Um, these are some benefits that are commonly associated with these projects. Uh, lower pollution, consistent low cost feedstocks, either clean liquid fuels or renewable energy. Uh, there are tax credits, of course, that are associated with this project. And then some local employment opportunities, of course. 
So the, this, this low NOx burner or super low NOx burner has been mentioned. Um, ACTI actually has the lowest producing uh, NOx burners in the world. Uh, the, the burner portion of the pyrolysis system is one of the, the three places where emissions can take place. So there's the feedstock processing portion where it goes through the assembly line, it goes through a dryer and a shredder. There's some mechanical activity there, so there are some emissions. The burner traditionally is another place where emissions could take place. This system has the lowest emissions in the world from this portion. And then the final emissions point <coughs> the final emissions point is the actual generator. This is a traditional internal combustion gas engine, just like your car. It'll be, uh, depending on the size and model that are ch that's chosen, it could be two to four of these units. Uh, if you convert megawatts into horsepower, then we will be producing the functional equivalent of 27 cars worth of emissions. Two differences, though. Uh, first, we will be using it, we will be using gas and not petroleum. So there are lower emissions from gas than petroleum. And then not only that, of course, ours is renewable gas as opposed to fossil fuel derived gas. But just to put it into uh, perspective, sort of in order of magnitude, it's approximately 27 200 horsepower cars running 24 7. This technology has been commercially deployed at least 17 times that I know of. Uh, at least 15 of those 17 are still in commercial operation. I happen to be on the advisory board of a company in Chino, California that has been using this technology happily since 2005. They just shut down their system last year. They're moving it to San Jacinto where they're buying a second unit so that they can, they can increase their operations. The technology they use is the same, but they use cow manure, dairy cow manure, and they dry it, shred it, prepare it, send it through the system, and they're producing actually uh, liquid fuels or renewable diesel. But the following photos are just some of the systems that are in commercial deployment. So this is the one in California. Same size and model as we'll be using, although we'll be purchasing four and using them as a system. Uh, this is uh, one for Japan that used tires as the feedstock. Uh, this Korea, Korean project is using biomass to create both hydrogen and liquid fuels. It's a Los Angeles County that project that creates uh, uh, renewable fuels through a human sewage sludge. This one is uh, using MSW to create uh, electricity similar to ours. The Chinese project. And then some more. You can see how there, it's a modular system. It can be expanded to fit the size and needs of the project. So this is an actual list of the plants. They range from six tons per day to 600 tons per day. Our project proposes to use 100 tons a day of locally sourced MSW and wood waste to create renewable electricity. Uh, in addition, our colleagues here from Dave Coast Steel, who I'll hand off to in just a few minutes, uh, have produced at least 100 projects nationwide and in North America, including these in the uh, Carolinas and Virginia. Um, for those in the back, I'll just read a few of them. Asheville, North Carolina, Clyde, North Carolina, Greensboro, Roxboro, another half dozen in South Carolina, and then another half dozen in Virginia. So they have wide experience throughout the region, throughout the, this part of the country. Although, we will have approximately 45 minutes of, of questions following, and I am almost done. I just wanted to anticipate what some of the questions were. These are frequently asked questions, um, so I'll just go through these, and then anything that you'd still like to ask, and I'm sure there'll be quite a bit, we can do at the end.
the price. The, the price of the system is approximately 23 or 24 million dollars. It will be privately financed through a combination of tax equity, regular equity, which is just equity investors making investments, and then debt. The debt will either come from traditional project finance lenders or possibly municipal bond purchasers. Uh, in terms of schedule and process, we are currently in the phase of getting our contracts together. That includes contracts for the waste, it includes contracts for the sale of power, it includes contracts with our engineering team, which is actually quite extensive, and then from there we'll be filing permits. We filed a couple of permits today, sorry, <coughs> recently, which is why we're here today, that some of those, uh, you know, the public notice. But we'll be filing further permits with uh, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. These are the air emissions permits, uh, any, any solid waste permits, and water and waste, wastewater discharge permits, soil erosion, those sorts of permits. Those will be done at the very early part of the summer. Uh, we hope to have them granted by the fall. We'd like to close on financing uh, toward the end of the fourth quarter and begin construction before the end of the year. The construction period is anticipated to take approximately 10 to 12 months. So assuming it takes 12, we hope to be producing power by January 1st, 2015. Uh, the bottom bullet on this first category is, is that it? And um, the answer is, yes, that's it for now. However, if and when we're able to get commercial operations up and running, we do, pan we do plan a phase two and potentially a phase three. These are by no means written in stone. In fact, there's a 0% chance that we'll get to phase two and phase three if we do not do phase one. Phase two and phase three. <laughs> phase two and phase three look very much like phase one. Additional 100 ton per day segments. However, the end goal is to produce renewable diesel. This is diesel from renewable sources that can be put directly into your cars, trucks, and buses or for industrial use. It's not a blending feedstock, it's an actual on-road transportation fuel. Greenness. Um, what about air emissions and greenhouse gases? There are emissions. I can't say that there are no emissions. There are almost no emissions from the pyrolysis portion of the project, but there are some emissions from the dryer and the shredder, and there are some emissions from the generator. The emissions from the generator uh, as I've spoken with Tina, are uh, approximately one-sixth to one-eighth what the, the threshold is for a major source under the Clean Air Act. Accordingly, we will be a synthetic minor source. There are very low emissions. This is a very small power plant. Water or wastewater discharge. There will be very little, but the amount that will be there will be channeled into uh, a holding pond at the down hill portion of the property. I can scroll back if you like, but it, it's basically toward the bottom and uh, toward the west. Are you sure that it's not incineration or combustion? Why not? What's different? Incineration and combustion, by their very different definition, require that you are burning something. The fire actually touches the product, creates heat and smoke and light and then particulate emissions. Our process has a hard separation between the burner portion and the feedstock portion such that the fire never touches the product. Because of that, those types of particulate emissions, the black soot that some of you might be anticipating, will not happen. And the, the syngas itself is very clean, and the few emissions that do occur happen from the power generation side uh, and not the, the pyrolysis side. Does this project pass North Carolina's environmental limits for permitting? Yes, it does. Uh, I've permitted several projects in North Carolina. Um, some of them include uh, City of Durham and Wayne County landfill gas projects, landfill gas <coughs> projects. Uh, the Davidson County Sun Edison solar project, which was 18 megawatts. Uh, I've been working on the uh, the ethanol project, the cellulosic ethanol project in Clinton, North Carolina for Chemtex that will produce uh, close to 20 million gallons a year of cellulosic ethanol. 
and then some other similar project uh, just over the border in South Carolina. Noise, odor, and aesthetics. Uh, we want to be your neighbors, and as such, we don't want to make you mad at us. And so the things that you are concerned about, in addition to the obvious air emissions issue, include noise, odor, and aesthetics. What will we look and sound like as you're passing by Old Hendersonville Highway or Crab Creek Road? I'll take this uh, bottom to top. Aesthetics. As the property currently sits, Old Hendersonville Highway is several feet above the hangar spaces where the airport stores planes. Uh, we will be building some foliage, building, planting, sorry. <laughs> planting some foliage at uh, the northern perimeter of the project. I'm pretty certain it will be literally impossible to see our power plant from the road. Odor. All of this magic, as they called it in that unfortunate video, um, happens indoors. We are not having a big outdoor power plant. Uh, there will be some noise, obviously, from the drying process, from the shredding. The generator itself makes noise. It's that loud hum that you heard. Um, all of the, the louder portions, the drying, the shredding, the feedstock processing, trucks coming in and out, will happen during business hours. We will, we will not be doing any of the murfing portion, the feedstock processing portion, during evening or nighttime hours. However, the pyrolysis system itself will run 24 hours a day. But as I said, it will be indoors, and we will make sure that it, uh, there's no ambient noise from, from the street. Similarly, odor, uh, as it's indoors and we will have odor control and negative pressure systems in the building, it should be almost no odor outside of the property. Obviously, if you're in the room with the system, there will definitely be odor. Uh, it is refuse-derived fuel, after all, but there should be none of that that actually finds its way to the street. <coughs> Truck traffic. We will be bringing in up to 200 tons a day of feedstock. The average dump truck or garbage truck holds about 12 tons. The average long-haul trailer, 20 to 22 tons. So will be somewhere in that 12 to 14, 12 to 15 truck per day range. We are doing very serious investigation into alternative fuel vehicles. We're looking at natural gas, including natural gas from our system. We're looking at electricity, electric driven trucks, including electricity from our system. And we, uh, our intent is to make this as low an impact as possible. Electric trucks are particularly desirable because they don't have very much noise at all. And uh, the footprint, the carbon footprint, is, is much lower, of course. What about the rail spur? The, the map, as you saw, has uh, a rail spur on the southern edge of the property. Uh, we picked the property because it has excellent qualities for us, including existing infrastructure, uh, good road access, and yes, good rail access. Phase one of the project will absolutely not use the rail. Phase two, if we're lucky enough to have a phase two, probably will not use the rail. But we don't know as we go, for, go forward whether we will need the rail or not. The quantities that we're talking about are, are small enough that it could actually be accomplished through trucks. So we, we haven't really done any serious commitment on the rail, but we do recognize that there's an attractive quality to having the rail there. And eventually there's some potential that it could be used. But as of this time, uh, we have no present intention of using it. So basically, that's, that's my portion. I'm going to invite uh, my Dave Co colleagues up to talk a little bit more about the feedstock processing portion, because that's, that's the part that's a little bit different and a little more um, activity intensive from a lot of uh, county perspectives. <coughs> But I really am grateful for all of your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. And um, our website is almost complete. We should have it up in the next week or so, I hope. And it's just renewabledevelopers.com. And um, feel free to check there periodically for updates. We promise that we will update it regularly for all <coughs> milestones as they occur, as we get permits, or as we get new contracts, or as we 
finished design phases. We promise to post those on the website. And um, then it's quite likely also that uh, our friend Mark Burroughs might be able to convince us to come back every few weeks and do this again. So, gentlemen, you have a, another? Well, Mark, uh, we prepared about 10 or 12 slides to show you what a MRF, a material recovery facility, would look like. This is one of my... Yeah, here we go. Thank you. How about now? Thank you. And good afternoon to everybody in the back. Um, first, I'm Ricky Hardy from Lawrence. I'm a business developer in Daco Steel. I spent a lot of years in designing and building MRF material recovery facilities. We, we like to say short, we're MRF builders and designers. We build them all over the Carolinas and Virginia, as you saw from the slide. And that's what I'm going to do is, is show you some, um, some, I think that's it right there. Show you some, some pieces of MERS that would be very similar to what we plan to put on the front end of this system. MERS are simply facilities that take your recyclables, the, the material you have in your home today, separate it to its lowest common denominator. We sell the products we separate plastic, the aluminum, the cardboard, the fiber. What Mark and Peter are looking for is actually the residual of that, which would normally go to a landfill and be buried and be there forever. That's the great part of this, is we're saving the most landfill space as possible by, by putting a MRF on the front end of their system. Um, this, is, this is a system that's, that's actually in Person County. We build very modular systems. They're all custom designed uh, for the application. Uh, once we know who is going to participate in the system, we will take a waste characterization of your streams in your homes, in your business, and we'll take a waste characterization. We will design the system to separate all of the sellable materials and leave Mark and Pete with what's left and that's what will go through the system. So is it zero waste? There's no such thing as zero waste. If anybody tells you that, I would challenge them myself. I've been in it a long time. There will be some residual at the end of the day. Usually in the three, four, five percent range. It depends on every community, but if there will be some. It'll be properly disposed of in a landfill. Um, this system is modular. This is actually the entire separation system. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one thing you're going to see in this is, is how the process begins. This is what we call the end feed, a metering drum. It regulates the amount that we can process per hour. Most of the systems are in the 12 to 15 tons of an hour range. Mark is looking for 100 tons so we will process more material than Mark needs at the end of the day. But this is our end feed. This is where it starts. When I get it from your home, we're going to put it in this system and start the process. Pre-sort conveyors. Uh, simply, we've got eyes and hands. There's no better sorters than what these are. Uh, we can look for wrappables. We look for garden hoses. We can look for batteries. We can look for all sorts of things that you can't see, that machines can't recognize. We want to take them out on the front end. We want to minimize any impact to the environment. So we will have people on what we call a pre-sort or quality control and take a look at it immediately. If you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see the metering gun turning, the materials going up, and it's immediately to a pre-sort. These operators have the capability of stopping that system at any time. There's a pull cord along the side. If they see something, they don't know what it is, or they just don't recognize it or we need to do something with it, they can stop it immediately before it gets further in the process. The next piece of the puzzle is an OCC screen, cardboard. That's a valuable commodity to help lower the cost of the system. We will separate the cardboard out, bale it, and sell it to the end user, Rock Tins, International Paper, Sudoku, 
different people. There will be a bailing operation associated with this, and we will sell it off as a marketable good. We also will do fiber. I think the next one is, a, is, is the OCC. You can see the cardboard it was separated by machine. After we went through the QC, that's the cardboard that's in it. The container line is next. Um, it's a simple system of containers. Is what your water bottles, your beverage bottles, your uh, dishwashing, anything that's a 3D. If you turn a container up, it's got a little symbol on the bottom, one through seven. That's basically the container line. We're going to take those containers out. There are markets for all of that. So we'll take the containers out on the container line. We can do this through hand separation, or we can do it through optics that recognizes the density of each material and separates it with an airflow. Don't know which way we'll go yet when we're in the early stages, but we'll, we'll capture the one through seven plastics. This is a, a fiber screen, glass breaker deck. This particular system is in Hampton, Virginia. You'll notice the top portion is where the glass is broken. We're going to take the glass out early on in the system. The next part will separate your magazines, your newspapers, any fiber, the junk maker. We'll take it out. You can see the fiber coming off, separated by machine. That system there separates about 20 tons an hour. Uh, very efficient. Uh, By this time, at this point in the waste stream, you got the product that we've taken out or everything that's undesirable in our QC station. We've taken that out. We've taken out the heavy cardboard. We've moved the plastics, the container line. We've moved it to another section, and we're separating the paper. Paper's another sellable product. Transylvania Times, I'm sure somebody here has probably printed on recyclable paper. That's where that comes from. It's easier to make paper the second time than it was the first time. There's a lot less process involved in it. So that's what we're doing is trying to capture the paper. Container sort. We can either sort it by hand, uh, local job, local money. We can sort it by hand or we can sort it by optics. We have two options there and we can do that very efficiently at the end of the day. Uh, cross belt magnets. Uh, the magnet is a piece long ways. It actually takes out the metal that's in the waste stream. The burden depth is about six inches deep when it goes under that magnet. It takes it out, puts it in a bin. That stuff is sorted and sold to the, to the new cores of the world. Uh, whatever we need to do with it, that's where the metal goes in this system. Eddy current is very similar. I don't have a good slide of that, although it is on the back side of this system. Um, the eddy current takes out the aluminum cans. Very efficient, no hand sorting. The aluminum can passes over the eddy current. Eddy, cor eddy current simply throws it into a blower and we blow it into a bin. At the end of the day, we bail it. Goes right back to Coca Cola, goes right back to Anheuser Busch or your favorite beverage company, not endorsing anybody. Um, <laughs> Although they're, they're all in this area. A lot of breweries in this area. I don't think we'll have a problem getting rid of the uh, aluminum. Next part is the baler. The baler is the, the long piece under the conveyor down at the bottom. You see the bales. Bales are either shipped domestically to mills here or they can be exported. There is sufficient demand for material in the Carolinas because of the Sunokos of the world called the Rock Tins over the edge of Tennessee, they reuse a lot of this. There, there's about 20,000 jobs just in the state of North Carolina that's connected to recycle. Blue Ridge Plastics grind and recycle. A lot of, lot of plastic recycling in this area. B&W, Volvo up in Virginia, using a lot of this plastic. So it doesn't, it, markets are not far from here for what we're going to separate. Bales can weigh anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Obviously, they're moved by forklifts, loaded in the trucks. A typical MRF will probably ship two to three trucks a day. Usually, at the end of the day, when the, when the bailing is done, it's when it's shipped back. The control panel, we do build our own electrical control panels in-house at Danco Steel. They're all tailored. 
to what we do. They can be anywhere from 30 to 50 motors involved in this. It's very friendly. This touch screen is rabbit turtle kind of thing. Uh, it, we will employ probably 15, 12 to 15 people in the MERS side of the house. Uh, when it's all said and done, if, if we go through with the project as it's sized, uh, I think we have got it. This is one I want to show you. I know it's hard to see. The material actually comes in. This is an actual working system in Virginia Waste in Chester, Virginia. The material comes into an end feed, the big yellow metering drum I told you about, a, a pre sort <coughs> quality control station, the OCC screen, the finished cardboard, remember the big pile of cardboard is over here. Then we go into a glass breaker deck, fiber screen, the fiber comes out, uh, containers, eddy, a magnet, eddy current at the end, and a bailing system. That is a typical setup on a murk. The other piece that we would have to this system would be the dryer, the um, the rejects is what Mark and Peter looking, I mean Matt and Peter looking for. This is the rejects conveyor. It would go into a holding area straight into a dryer. It would be heated with the gas we're generating. We have to get it dry enough in order to put it in, in through the system. So we would dry it internally in the building. Uh, and that's where we are with a, with a material recovery facility or a MRF. That's a typical layout. This one may look entirely different, but that's most of the components that would be in it. And we're in Lawrence. Um, we built the system for American Recycling in Asheville, outside of Asheville. Done a lot of work for Hayward County. Done a lot of work with Sunoco. Uh, we built a number of them in Virginia, uh, Bay Disposal, Chester, Virginia, Winchester, Virginia, uh, Rafter, Virginia. Built a lot of these systems. They all look different. If I put you in my truck in the morning, you see the same pieces, but they're all different. They're very quiet operation systems. Our systems run <coughs> at a level that you don't even have here in protection. The Person County system, one of the best MRF in the state of North Carolina, and they use challenged workers, both mentally and handicapped. It's especially designed for them. Very, very low uh, noise. The only dust part to it, if there is a dust part, is in the OCC screen. And I always tell people, I was executive director at O'Reilly County Solid Waste Authority in down here in Myrtle Beach for years. And I always tell people, I'm processing what you have in your home. What you had at your home yesterday is what I've got in my system today. So, same thing is there. I'm not making material, I'm just simply processing what all of you are sending out avoiding the landfill and trying to create something else for it. That's, that's the, what we're doing. That's what this whole system is about, protecting the environment from not landfilling more and more of our product, our waste that we have in our homes. Thank y'all. So that's, that's the end of our prepared presentation. Uh, it's 8 o'clock. Spend as much time as you like with any questions that you have. If there's anything that we can't answer today because we're still in the design process with engineers, then um, we will absolutely report back when we do have an answer.